Exactly 100 years ago, on February 26, 1920, the world's first true horror film debuted in Germany, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. This silent film is widely considered to be the quintessential work of German Expressionist cinema, which is a fancy way of saying that the film is meant to serve as a break from reality by utilizing an extreme and excessive visual style. And boy does it deliver on that. It's probably the very first thing I noticed while watching the film. The set design is otherworldly, and it gives the film its eerie quality that has endured for a hundred years. But that isn't the only reason to check out this film. By analyzing the best films from the past, we can learn more about films in our present. So here's why The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is one of the greatest films in history. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari uses a narrative device called a frame to introduce the characters and establish the main story, which makes it a very early use of non-linear storytelling in film. The opening scene is of the main character Francis and an unnamed older man talking about Jane, who we learn is Francis' girlfriend. In order to explain why she is acting so strangely, walking around in a trance-like state, Francis tells this man, and us, the story of his best friend Alan, and of their dealings with Dr. Caligari. Immediately here, I was struck by two things. The rudimentary yet effective score by Alfredo Antonini, and the unconventional use of vignette. Remember, vignetting is darkening of the edges of the frame, and this film uses it masterfully. I'm not an expert on 1920s cinema. I don't know if this was commonplace back then in order to highlight important information, or if this was an unusual technique developed by the director. But either way, I thought it was worth noting. After this opening scene, the tale then unfolds in six acts. In Act 1, Dr. Caligari comes to town, and he's looking for a good place to perform. And here, immediately, we get a glimpse of the tone. We see impressive, impressionistic backdrop paintings as the set design. This look will carry through the rest of the film, and it gives an extreme distortion of reality in order to reflect a dark and twisted world. And this opening scene of Dr. Caligari utilizes what I'm guessing is a slight camera trick with shutter speed to give his character jittery movements. At least, that's what I assume it is, because if that's a performance, then it's unbelievable. Dr. Caligari goes to City Hall to ask the city clerk for a permit so that he can perform in the city square. While he's there, he's made to wait, and he's treated rudely, which makes him angry. And here's where we get into the symbolism of the film. In this City Hall scene, we see that the town clerk sits high up above everyone else. I think you could say that he represents government authority, or possibly even bureaucracy and order in general. Now keep this in mind, it's going to be important later. After this visit to City Hall, Dr. Caligari takes up residence in the town square, and he's about to give a performance. We learn here that he's a sonambulist, and I don't think I'm saying that right. Act 2 begins with a brief scene of police officers discovering the murder of the city clerk. And who did the clerk make mad earlier? Oh right. The scene then transitions to Francis and his best friend, Alan, attending Dr. Caligari's first performance. Dr. C is in command of a sleepwalker named Caesar. Basically, what their act amounts to is Dr. Caligari waking up this sleepwalker so that people can ask him questions about the future. It's kind of a strange thing that I'd never heard of before this movie. Alan and Francis approach the stage, and Alan asks Caesar a question. When will I die? And Caesar replies, Before dawn. Creepy. Alan and Francis are shaken by this, and so they head home. On the way, they see a poster that says that there has been a murder, and the murderer is still at large, which is alarming. But they are distracted when they see Jane, the Jane that we saw earlier in the film. We come to understand that they both love Jane, and they want to let her decide which one of them that she will marry. Which I guess is nice? Act 2 then ends with Alan being brutally murdered while at home in bed. 
And if you hadn't yet thought this movie was brilliant, just from the set design alone, this innovative use of shadow in Alan's murder scene showcases just how ahead of its time this film is. Francis discovers that Alan is dead and begins an investigation along with Jane's father. They go directly to Caesar because Caesar earlier made the prediction that he would die before dawn. But when they arrive, Caesar is asleep in, well, the cabinet. Dr. Caligari denies that Caesar could have had anything to do with killing Alan, saying that he was asleep the entire time. It's also here that I want to mention the amazing use of color and setting used by the filmmakers here. They used a technique of dyeing the film to give certain scenes a colored look. They used an orangey yellow sepia tone for scenes in daylight or scenes lit by fire. They used a bluish green for darkness and night. And they used a pink hue for the inside of Jane's home, which is only used a handful of times, yet is extremely effective. All of this investigation has now taken a long time and Jane gets worried about her father and about Francis. So she decides to go see Dr. Caligari, hoping to find her dad. This leads us to a very iconic image. Even for a hundred years ago, it's still very creepy, and Jane obviously becomes suspicious of these two men, and she leaves. She was right to be suspicious, because later that night, while Francis goes to Dr. Caligari's house to watch him and Caesar to make sure they don't go on some killing spree, Caesar actually breaks into Jane's home to try and kill her. Now, this is probably one of the most complex sections of the film. What the film is doing is trying to show that Caesar is somehow in two places at once. This is quite an advanced technique for 1920 cinema, and it deserves a lot of credit. Not only is it a technical achievement, but the scene where Caesar approaches Jane while she's sleeping is not only extremely effective at being creepy and scary, but it's also quite innovative for its time. Everything from the framing, the dramatic irony, the tension, and the perspective are quite advanced, and this scene reminds me of the scene in Citizen Kane, where perspective also plays a key role. Who knows, this may have even been an influence on Orson Welles. Stricken by love, Caesar decides not to kill Jane, but to kidnap her instead. Caesar eventually lets her go, but in the process, he falls off a cliff to his death. We then cut back to Francis to see that Caesar is still asleep with Dr. Caligari, and the act ends with the audience scratching their heads. Francis leaves the house of Dr. Caligari and goes to Jane's house, where he learns what happened. Confused, he goes to confront Dr. Caligari, who brings out the cabinet, the casket, and shows them Caesar still asleep. Yet when they examine more closely, they and the audience see that the Caesar in the cabinet is actually a doll. In all that confusion, Dr. Caligari sneaks away and then Francis runs after him. Dr. Caligari leads Francis on a chase and goes to an insane asylum. When Francis enters, he asks the staff if someone named Dr. Caligari is a patient. They tell him that he needs to go see the director, but when Francis approaches the director's office, he is shocked to find that the director is actually Dr. Caligari himself. Now this is the first of a series of plot twists at the end of this movie, and I must say that it's worth noting that this is a very early use of plot twists in the art of cinema, and an effective one at that. It helps to throw off the audience, which adds to the feeling of unease and of dread. Francis, in shock, leaves the office and he tells the staff of the asylum all about the murders, so they agree to help him. That night, while the director is sleeping, the staff and Francis search the director's office. Inside the office, they find a book that details the myth of Dr. Caligari. They also find the director's diary. We learned through this sequence 
that the director idolizes this mythic figure of Dr. Caligari and is obsessed with the question of whether a sleepwalker could be compelled to commit murder. Act 5 ends with a flashback sequence of the director's first meeting with Caesar and that his being overjoyed at his opportunity to live out his fantasy. In the flashback, we see the director's descent into madness as he hallucinates the words become Dr. Caligari over and over and over. This entire sequence is incredible for its time. This flashback transition, first of all, is extremely innovative. I love how it utilizes the quadrants of the frame to show that we're transitioning from one time to another. It's also worth noting that this descent into madness is an early use of visual effects, with seeing the words being written on the walls and in the air. The staff at the asylum find Caesar's dead body, bring it to the director, and confront him with it. When the director sees it, he cries out in anguish. But the staff then wrap the director in a straitjacket and place him in a cell. This is when the frame comes back into play, as the film then centers back on the two men from the beginning of the story, Francis and the unnamed old man. This brings what we're led to believe is closure to all of the narrative threads that had been woven at the beginning. They leave where they were, and they begin to walk, and then they enter the main room of the asylum. Inside the asylum, we see many, many people, including Jane, sitting on what looks like a throne. And, and Caesar is awake, smiling, and he's holding flowers. Francis sees Caesar and is frightened, even though he's not intimidating in this form. He warns the old man not to let Caesar tell his future or he'll die. Then Francis sees Jane, goes over to her, and asks her to marry him. And she responds cryptically, We are not free to answer the call of our hearts, she says. Then, the strangest of all happens. The director emerges from the staircase behind them. Yet, he looks different. He looks normal. As the director approaches, Francis begins to freak out, saying, That's Dr. Caligari! But the director tells the staff to surround Francis, and they put him in a straitjacket and carry Francis upstairs. And in the final moments of the film, we see the director say, I understand now his delusion. He thinks I am Dr. Caligari, and I now know how to help him. The end. So what do we take from this story? Well, there's actually an immense depth of meaning here. Remember, the town clerk symbolized government authority or possibly bureaucracy. There are many film critics who actually see Dr. Caligari representing totalitarianism. Now go with me here, because I actually agree with them. Dr. Caligari is a puppet master of sorts for Caesar, who is asleep. The theory goes that Caesar represents normal people in society who blindly do the government's bidding. Dr. Caligari, representing totalitarianism, wants to kill any other leaders in the city and wants to take advantage of the consumerism of the masses. He does this by offering people a glimpse into a future, the people being so excited to have their fortunes be told by the sleepwalker represents people looking to an authoritarian state for answers. But just like what happens often with totalitarian regimes, the people hope for good news for the future, but they find a bad fortune instead. And I don't think this symbolism can be removed from the history from which it exists. Remember, in 1920, we're a handful of years removed from World War I. And the fact that this film comes out of Germany tells us a lot about the state of mind of the people after that war. The other major symbol here is actually the expressionist set techniques, which represent the schizophrenic state of mind that a totalitarian regime can cause. But the other theory here is that the city is twisted because the story is told through the eyes of a madman. I like both of those interpretations. Now that we know the story and we understand some of the symbolism and the themes, why does the title focus on the cabinet that Caesar sleeps in? 
The cabinet represents the prison of the totalitarian state. Remember, Jane told Francis, we are not free to answer the call of our hearts. People living under that kind of oppressive government might as well be asleep in a cabinet. Their only purpose is to do the bidding of the oppressors, and often that bidding is criminal. This movie is simple, pure, economical storytelling at its best. It's a complex story that has a lot of political and societal messages, yet it's told in such simple scenes. And this is an amazing example of how analyzing the best films from the past can teach us so much about films in our present. That is why The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is one of the greatest films in history.